Hi, I'm John Schreiber. For 18 seasons, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center has been the state's premier home to world-class and community-centered performances. We pride ourselves on presenting something for everyone. That's why we're proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to produce One-on-One -on -one with Steve Adubato at NJPAC. This unique series features some of the best talent New Jersey has produced. We're pleased to welcome them and you to the Arts Center. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -one with Steve Adubato at NJPAC has been provided by Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, Cohn Resnick, Accounting, Tax, and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results. The Fidelco Group, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree, and by Josh S. Weston. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We are coming to you from the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This is one-on-one, -on -one, but in this case, it is one-on-two. We are honored to introduce the two gentlemen you're about to see on camera. The first one is uh, Willie Geist. You know him, he's the co-host of the third hour of NBC's uh, Today Show, I know that show, and uh, co-host of MSNBC's Morning Joe. And the gentleman to your left is uh, Bill Geist, correspondent with CBS News Sunday Morning. And the two of you have written a book. The book is called Good Talk, Dad, The Birds and the Bees and Other Conversations We Forgot to have. Gentlemen, it is an honor to, ha an honor to have you here at the NJ Pack. You like this place, Thanks right? Thanks for having me. I do. Where it's a beautiful room. I've been here before to, to different events. This is a beautiful facility. In I was Newark. here for a concert. It's, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. It's good digs, right? Now, yeah. i got to ask you, that whose idea was it to write this book, Good Talk, Dad? I think, you know what? It's funny. It was neither of our idea. It was a book editor's idea yeah. and a book agent's idea. I think yeah. there, I think people assume because we're in the same business, we ought to do something together. I would say, you should do something together. We never quite knew what that meant. Is it a TV show? I don't know, father, son, something or other. And we went out to lunch one day with a, a great friend and an editor of ours. And we started telling family stories and she was laughing so yeah. hard. She said, this is the book. And we said, well, if all we have to do is sit down and tell the stories we already know and put them in a book, I think we can pull yeah, that well, off. You only have to write half a book. So. <laughs> that was his hey, selling point. You're very practical. Half the advance, too. You know, half the, well, I'll yeah. tell you what. I'll tell you what. I, this is one of those books, and Willie will not admit this. Um, we don't read all of the books cover to cover that we're supposed Steve, to. I'm sorry. I don't know what you mean. I know you don't know what I mean. Yeah. I did read this book <laughs> cover to cover. At least you know who we are. This is PBS. We read everything. <laughs> Ready for this? I'm going to throw out a chapter, okay. which I've read every word. So don't. I believe you. Yeah, yeah. You, you You're correct. Us if Ready we for don't this? Remember. Dad, this really sucks. Mm. That was fishing. chapter four. You said to your son, <laughs> "I am going to take." I'm not going to tell the story you are, but you said, "Son, I am going to have you fish because I never really got to appreciate going fishing." Right, and it was sort of part of the whole list of things that, as a good father, you were supposed yes. to impart to your sons and daughters. What happened, how to Bill? Fish, but I didn't know how to fish. <laughs> what happened, Bill? Well, I got him up about four in the morning because there was another guy going with us who did know how to fish. I was smart enough to do that. And uh, we, we got out there. We were in the fog out in Nantucket. And I looked down the beach, and it's about 6 o'clock, and we've cast about a 1,000 times, usually in the water, sometimes in the beach, or <laughs> snagging one of our cohorts. And uh, I heard this voice out of the fog say, Dad, I said, Yes, son. He said, this really sucks. <laughs> and I said, yes, it does, son. Yes, my, it does. My poor dad is trying to do the right thing. Sure. It's like unfinished business. He and his dad didn't fish. They didn't camp. They do all the father-son things they're supposed to do. <laughs> so God bless him. He's trying to do them. And it just never worked. And that's sort of a thread through the book. We tried to do the things that fathers and sons are supposed to do. And it always ended like that in the fog with me telling him how much what we were doing I think sucked. it's all on me, really. I think I was yeah. supposed to do, yeah, so. exactly. Now you have to do better <laughs> with your son. Right. And, and by the way, tell folks, uh, your, your son is? George, five years old, yeah. And Lucy, seven. Yeah, my daughter's seven. You're a good dad. Thanks. I you've, try to be. You, you, you write a lot about your kids, too. You've learned a lot about being a dad from being a son to Bill? 
Yeah, and none of it has been from explicit advice that, that he's given me. It's all been observational. You know, you watch how someone spends time with their kids or makes time for their kids, and you don't realize it when you're a kid. Right. But then you get to a certain age when you have your own kids, you say, oh my gosh, my dad rushed home from the New York Times and dove off the bus every day to coach our little league team. So he found a way to yeah. balance his good career, successful career, with being a good dad to us, and that's where you learn. Yeah, we should also talk about that, Bill, because uh, some, a lot of people watching on public broadcasting um, may know Willie to some extent because yeah. you're a star. Uh, wasn't so much of a star then, he was football and basketball. He was a co he was captain of his football team, captain of his basketball team at Ridgewood. Ridgewood, New okay. Jersey. So was go I, they just forgot to put it in. <laughs> you, you know, we I didn't read that you were a captain. No. Were you a captain? I, I don't like to talk about it. Because it's not true. <laughs> That's why I was like a captain it. of the but, people who got cut. <laughs> but, you know, let's talk about that. We'll talk about camp, because yeah. you had a horrific camp yes, experience. I think it was also in New, his fault. Yeah. New Hampshire? New Hampshire, yeah. <laughs> but that was a bad call you made. We'll talk about that in a second. Because there was gang war warfare apparently yeah. there, yeah. which was not part of the brochure. No. So that being said, i got to ask you this. You have read the book. I got, I'm shocked. I just, that was my you way of proving. You go on a book tour, you don't expect um, to encounter somebody who's read the book. The Bloods and the Crips were there. So here's what happens. When he's playing football, when he's playing basketball, by the way, 6'4 and can dunk, and allegedly he can still dunk. Uh, there's a basketball court around the corner we're going to see. Did, this is Newark. This, this is Brick City. We're going to see uh, if you can do it. Here's the deal. You talked about how proud you were. Because you moved, I think, from Chicago to New yes, York, mostly correct. because you didn't want him to be a Cub fan, which shows you really love your son. That's right. So, uh, big Yankee fan, here's the question. How proud were you, as someone who did not succeed athletically, to see this kid succeed the way he did in mostly basketball and football, become a star? How big a deal of that well, was that for you? To ask me, you know, if I'm proud of him, and it's just like he, now with his career. I mean, it's not pride so much as just you're so happy because I don't know if pride, I think you have to take a little of the credit for it. Being, but I think, I think it's just that you knew he was happy. You knew he loved to play basketball and sports and, and wanted him to succeed when he was emptying garbage cans down at CNN mm -hmm. in Atlanta. <laughs> and you just feel happy that, that your kids are happy. What was it like for you? Well, it's so interesting. When I think about my dad and how much of what I did for whatever I did in sports, which is not being the captain of the team, I'll assure you that was because I wanted my dad to be there. I wanted my dad to yeah. say, hey, great job. And then he'd say, hey, listen, the quarterback played a great game today. And it wasn't me who was the quarterback. Right. And I, he was very aware of comparing, which is why the therapy is involved. <laughs> How important was it for you to get what you got from your dad in terms of acknowledgement? It was hugely important. I think it's that way for any kid, for anything, whether it's sports or school or anything else. And like I said, he was... He was there at the games. I mean, when you start getting into higher levels of basketball and travel teams, we would blow open our Christmas vacations, and we'd come home halfway through Fly to go to some people. tournament in Matawan or wherever travel it was. Travel a lot. Yeah, you travel a lot, and your parents make sacrifices for you. And I always knew my dad's face up in the crowd. But he was a I, bad fan. Yeah. He was a bad fan. Talk about bad fan. We're, we're no, 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 talk this? about it's how true. bad he was with the referees. He you don't was, want me to walk off the set here. He, my dad, on, well, there's a, larger, there's a larger problem my dad has with authority in general. I think that stems back to his days in the Army, but that's a whole other conversation. Go ahead. That's correct. So my dad was not just a screamer <laughs> at the officials, but he always, found, he always found the hush in the crowd because he wanted to make sure that his point really got to the right. <laughs> what rack. kind of things would he say, Whittley? Um, he creative. That's what I was. He's get. a great writer. No, you know, he wasn't using obscene language or anything like that. I think my favorite was stick around for the team picture, ref. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Stick around for the team picture. It was like Bill Guy's greatest <laughs> hits, and he would. He so he'd wait for the hush in the crowd, and then he would stand. This is great. <laughs> so it was a I, little bit. What was it like for you? It was it was Horrible. slightly embarrassing. Yeah. It was slightly embarrassing. And sometimes my God bless my mother. She you know pull his arm down. Yeah. Take him out in the hallway to cool off. Yeah. Which is so funny because my dad is you. The world America knows him. He's a mild mannered, sure. uh, sweet, charming guy. But when it comes to competition and things like that, man, he got worked up. But, he, but it was important for him to send you to camp. It in was. New Hampshire. Ah, uh, yes, it was very important. Again, and, and, and it was a, it was a really a life changing experience for you, was it not? It was another thing that he didn't do as a kid that he thought he should do for his son: send send your kid away to camp. So and a proper camp with sparkling blue water and pine trees up around it. Yeah. up in up in New England somewhere. A proper. How camp. old were you? I was eleven. Become a young man. Eleven years old, exactly. Beautiful. So I'm in New Jersey. I'm growing up. My dad and mother go to the Javits Center to the Camp Expo. 
They find, the what? There's a camp expo. What do they promote they, their camp? Yeah, they, they put up a yes, booth. They come to this. Look one, at our look at our camp. Yeah, they get out of here. Some of them are in Sweden. I grew up in Europe. We didn't have that. Yeah, sure. No, I, I never heard of a camp expo until then. So my, my parents picked this one camp. The guy actually came to our house and did a slideshow. Yeah. Yes. Al? Yes. Okay. Okay, so he comes over, does a slideshow, closes the deal, looks perfect. You know, it's up in New Hampshire, in the woods, on the lake, the, the identifying leaves, the whole thing. So I get up there, they drop me off. It looks the part. It's, it's perfect. We weren't sure if the pictures he was showing us in our living room were of his camp. Yes. They were camp Two pictures. great journalists yes. can't figure camp. out whether it's legit or not. Okay, go they ahead. You don't, where's the second source? You didn't have a second. Go ahead. His, go ahead. They were stock Boy photos scared. of people canoeing, <laughs> as it turned go out. Ahead. So I get up to the camp, and it looks good. And then things kind of start to turn dark. And one morning in the mess hall, there's this sort of commotion, and the counselors are talking. And it turned out they'd gotten into a fight the night before, these two groups the of counselors. And one group of counselors had gone in the parking lot and slashed the tires <laughs> on the cars and bikes of the other guys. Slashed the tires. Beautiful. So what we learned at that point was that the count, and only at that point, not in the slideshow, was that the counselors at this camp were part of a reform program for juvenile offenders. So these were teenagers who'd committed, in some cases, violent crimes in our urban centers around the Northeast. Um, Bill, well, did Al not tell you this when he was Al pitching the camp? Al failed to mention that. I don't know. I say it wasn't in the brochure. I'm not sure Al had brochures. Okay. But we wanted our... It was good, though. It was a good it for, out, because for Because he met a different kind of kid. You don't want to... <laughs> growing up with a homogenous... So, so let me get this straight, Bill. You feel that you helped Willie become the young man he's become. Absolutely. So it's a good experience. In the camp, with regard to the camp, yes. So you succeeded. Why did you fail to actually sit down and speak to young Willie Geist about the birds and the bees? Too embarrassing. <laughs> Was it not a Have father's responsibility? The, the my father? Hell no. No, not your father. <laughs> Listen, you don't <laughs> know my father. You. I count my blessings. My father never had that conversation with me. Willie does, share too. With us? Willie counts his blessings yes. as well, because I tried to figure out birds and the bees. Why is it birds and the bees and not birds and a dog in heat or something. <laughs> and uh, so I just never, the time was just never right. And, and by a certain age, you kind of assume in this day and age, your kid knows more about sex than you do. Sure. And I think he probably still does. We had one attempt at it, and we were sitting watching a Yankee game as we did almost every night WPIX. of WPIX. WPIX. Playing the theme song. You love Phil Rizzuto. Love Scooter. And, and by the way, your favorite player was? Dave Winfield. Dave, yeah. Every All day. In fact, I used to write Dave Winfield postcards from our family vacations. When I was seven, eight, nine years old, we'd go up to... A young stalker, go ahead. Cape yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'd go up to Cape Cod and I'd fill out a, a postcard that'd say, Dear Winfield, always his last name, Dear Winfield. Yankee uh, Stadium. We played mini golf today. We went to the beach. Be home in a week. <laughs> Willie. Got it. And I handed it to my dad, and I'm sure my dad was just <laughs> chucking them in the garbage can as they came I think through. I still find them in my vest <laughs> pocket. I'll send um, them one day. But Winfield, so, so what happens? So we're sitting watching the Yankee game one night, and I, I think the way, essentially, this may not be verbatim, but this is the way it went down, was, um, hey, hey uh, Willie, what do you know about sex? I think there was a pitching change. There was a something. pitching change. We had a lull. Delay in the game. Willie, what do you know about sex? And I think my reply was, do we have any more pretzels? And I got up and walked away. <laughs> and scene. That was our sex so talk. So you got to put so some good. of this on him. OK, put it on him. I, I wasn't willing. Eight. The limited time we have left, I got a couple more uh, sensitive yeah. topics. You, for 20 years, oh. experienced, yeah, yeah, Parkinson's. It's, that kind of started the book. You know, we had, I had Parkinson's and hid it for a long time and eventually got to the place where I had it. Why did you hide it from your son, your daughter, I your think family? I think it's not the kind of thing you want. We want everything to be positive that you give to your kids, and I didn't want them worrying about it, worrying about if it was passed on to another generation or whatever. And I just, I just didn't like to talk about difficult things. Like, it's a joke with birds and the bees, but this was a more serious topic, and I just... I didn't want to admit to myself, and I haven't yet, that it's not going to go away. It's not going to go away, but... That actually was, you asked where the idea for the book came from, and it was, part of the impetus was, my dad let us in on this, and we said, how could we have not talked about this for 10 years? This is clearly the biggest thing happening in our family. What is it about us that we don't have these big conversations? And we have a great relationship. We've been close always, um, but we don't have the big conversation. You know, we kind of just let... If it's difficult, I guess we tend to sweep it I to the side and put it under the rug. I have the big talks or serious talks. They wanted everything to be okay. And I think in their, their, I grew up in Champaign, Illinois, and Willie has said before, 
it's probably a bad place for a psychiatrist to open an office because people in the nobody talks. Nineteen fifty well, Champaign, Illinois. You don't. Yeah, you don't talk about, about now, that. I mean, what about now with your dad? Yeah, now we now you know the best thing he did. I think two and a half years ago, he did a piece on Sunday morning and told the world. And the truth is, all our friends and family knew about it. And I think most Some of the viewers did. A too. lot of the viewers they would write knew. in and say, "Is something wrong with him or something?" And that kind of got. To but him. it was it was liberating. I don't know if he feels this way, but it was for me because now we can come out and talk about it. I'm on the board of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and you can try to help people. And I think what my dad found was there are so many people, a million people in the United States who have Parkinson's point to my dad as a guy who's been working on TV for 22 years with this mm. disease and you can keep going and keep living your life so he's inspired people so I'm glad he did finally You're decide proud to go public doing that. oh my god I'm really proud and at the Michael J Fox Foundation dinner is it not a fact that you got up and everyone was so emotional and you said oh. hey listen <laughs> something about a gun and thank yeah. god you didn't have a gun because if you tried to kill yourself what i might miss <laughs> He said he was going to write a book about it. I said, about I, his... said I thought about writing a book about it, but that's what I was going to call it. And the people just gasped when I said that because they thought I was serious. What's up with his sixth sense of humor? It's always been there. It's beautiful. Isn't it's it? always been there. You count on and it. And it's been a good thing to study, too. You know, like you grow up watching the, the he, sense he, of humor. He benefits because he can kind of go one off that, be a little more subtle than I <laughs> am. Um, you're proud of him, and I have a feeling oh, he's even prouder so. of you. I, I cannot thank you enough, both of you. Thank for you joining for, us. For reading here, the uh, book. Well, yeah, it's a great read. And uh, I'm going to read sections to my dad and see if, you know, it helps us. <laughs> yeah, it's a little late for the talk, but you can try. You mean mine with him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called uh, Good Talk, Dad, The Birds and the Bees and Other Conversations. We forgot to have two terrific journalists and two uh, people who are even better at being good people than Thanks, journalists. Steve. Thank you. Bill Geist um, from the Sunday morning show, yeah. CBS. Yeah. It's a good, great show. And Willie Geis, whose career is just faltering. It's terrible. <laughs> you can see him on the Today Show in the third yes. hour. Yes. And on uh, Morning Joe with those guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming. Thank to you. Thanks for having us, Steve. Much. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Stay right there. We'll be coming right back from NJ Pack right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Max Smirkowski, who is, uh, it says TV personality here, but it's so much more than that. Spent 14 years uh, dancing with the stars. Seasons. Se 14 seasons. He has uh, six tri-state area dance studios. They are called Dance With Me. You own them with your family, right? Yes. Who? Who's in your family involved? Uh, my dad and I started when I was 16. Uh, for no reason, lived in Brooklyn, ended up opening a studio in New Jersey. I've never even been to Jersey at that time. And uh, here we are many years later. Now, a lot of people who know you from Dancing With The Stars, right? How do you get the reputation as the bad boy? Like, where does that come from? I actually thought about this recently, leading up to this. Um, I think it's because I was never trained to be anything but, but an athlete, you know, and, and especially growing, I was born in Ukraine. You yeah, started uh, dancing at four. I did, unfortunately. Uh, but while dancing, I also swam semi-professionally, um, played tennis, soccer, all of those things. And, you know, we never had the money. We never had, you know, things weren't given to us. And, it's not a sad story. I had an amazing childhood. I was, whatever we lacked financially, we had an abundance of love. Um, but whenever we had to do something, our dad, um, who I guess he and mom had me when they were 19, were trying to prove themselves as parents. And I feel like they instilled this idea of you have to be the best at anything you do. Um, it's a little too extreme. And so, you know, I approached dancing with... Um, if there's a trophy to win, you have to win it, whatever it takes. At all costs? Nobody's going to judge you for how you get there. They're going to see the end result. 10, 15, 20 years from now, people don't remember, you know, what happened. They remember records. Um, when I joined Dancing with the Stars, that's, that, that was my approach. And I quickly realized that it's not the way it works on TV, and you should tone it down a little. Um, how hard was that for you? Uh, it was impossible. What do you mean impossible? Well, because, you know, I get somebody that doesn't dance. You know, uh, the format of... of a a so-called star. 
uh, you know, I had, I was actually lucky to actually have had stars. I felt that I was, I, I respected those people for what they've done. Um, so that wasn't an issue. The problem was, uh, in, the, in short, the way I analyze Dancing with the Stars is that we all race car drivers, the pros, and we're all given cars to race with. We don't have a choice in picking the car. So we just show up at the start line, somebody gets a nice Ferrari and somebody gets a beat up <laughs> Volvo from like 70s and there's nothing you can do you know so with this whatever it is that I get I have to try to do my best to win and a lot of times I felt looking back I feel like I've tried to do it against um, you know my better judgment and also mm. <laughs> it's like whether you like it or not I'm gonna right. drag you into that final you know, and so that wasn't the approach that I needed to take. You must have learned a lot about yourself. Tell us exactly what Sway is. Sway is a dance production that we put on, again, just a passion project. Uh, like everything else in our life, we do everything by accident. Who's we? My father, myself, my brother, we, we kind of, it's a soul of family thing. And, you know, we have people around us that we've accumulated over the years that we trust, that love, we love, that love us. And, you know, so there's quite a few of us now. Um, Where is it playing out? Uh, we, <laughs> we, um, Decided to do it in a small theater on Long Island. Um, it's next to my Long Island location of my studios. Um, we did one show, we did two shows, one day seven months ago. Um, and the, the, the town just came to life in that one day. We felt so proud of that, that we decided to put on eight shows in December through the holiday season. Um, I remember when we came back to make this other deal with the theater, the guy from Pizzeria on, across the street came over and he said, you know, I made a year's worth of business last time you were here. I'm like, well, you better buy a lot more product because we're going to be here for eight days. So, you know, these type of things. What's that like for you, knowing that you're changing a community by doing what you love? It's incredible. I'm not, I'm no, I'm, you know, when we came here, I was, we, we had an extremely difficult immigration. Very difficult. Not different from other immigrants, but it was very hard. And people that don't know, they have no idea. I wish you never find out. So for us to get from being thrown food stamps in my face when I was 14 in downtown Brooklyn to, you know, allowing somebody to make a better living because I'm playing something across the street, I don't care what people think of me. So without getting overly corny about this, Max, America, this country, what does it mean to you? This is the best place on earth. It's my home. Without a doubt, people don't realize, if you don't, if you don't leave it, you know, even for a day, you don't know what you got. Um, this is the best, most amazing place on earth. Having said that, the only difference between America and literally everything on, on the outside is the opportunity. Um, people from the outside think that this is this place where, where money falls from, from the sky, all you have to do is just be there and catch it. Just show up. That's not true. The thing that this place has, uh, a, a kid in, I don't know, West African country has um, the same, could be the Max or the whoever else, you know, but the difference is that there's no opportunity there. So this place gives you everything that you, that you, that you need to be successful. You just have to do it. Um, I would not traded for, the, for anything. My blue passport is my biggest possession after my family. Your passport. Dancing. You were joking before when I said you started dancing at such a young age and you joked and you said unfortunately. But dancing has given you, not it hasn't given you because you've worked so hard some of us can't even, most of us can't even comprehend how hard you've worked. Without dancing, do you have any idea what your life would be? The same. Why, why would you say the same? <clears throat> because uh, again, we grew up with our dad's a lot of phrases, and one of them was that it doesn't matter who you are, what your profession is, you have to find a way to be the best at it. Um, the example that he would bring up is that if you're a janitor, no disrespect to janitors, um, you have to find a way to live the life that you want, to have the end result that you want, to have the means that you want. But wasn't it dancing that had you break out and become someone who was recognized in this country? It would have been swimming, hockey, mathematics, chemistry. I was a chemistry and biology major you since I have was in you have that, sorry, seventh grade. For, for interrupt, you have that level of confidence that if it wasn't dancing, it would have been it's any not, number of other things. It's not confidence. It's just the fact that 
it's inevitable. Success is, is not a matter of choice if you work. Um, you know, I, I wrote something a couple of days ago. It's, uh, you know, opportunities um, are only special if you don't think you will have other opportunities. I know that the opportunities are everywhere around us. You know, you just need to be smart, you need to work hard, you need to recognize them. And, you know, that's what we pride ourselves on. Before I let you out of here, final things you're pursuing that we need to know about, other goals. Keep expanding your uh, studio, uh, right? Yeah, no, studio expansion is very important to me. I feel like that's, that's going to be my legacy and that's going to be something that I'll, you know, leave to my kids. Um, my biggest pursuit is to have a, a very happy family. You know, everything else is irrelevant. Max, we wish you nothing but the best and we appreciate you joining us at the uh, New Jersey Performing Arts Center. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, in cooperation with NJTV, and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been provided by Prudential Financials Global Communications Department, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, Cone Resnick, the Fidelco Group, NJ Best, and by Josh S. Weston. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. When you work in a public school, you're a part of the community. So when Superstorm Sandy hit, the school employees jumped right in to help. The middle school here served as a refuge for people who were forced from their homes. We all pitched in to help. Custodians, cafeteria workers, teacher aides, mechanics, groundskeepers, all pitching in to help out. School employees are part of a team, whether it's to help educate our children or to recover from a terrible tragedy. That's why I'm so proud to be a member of the NJEA.